technologies will be in most demand uh, in uh, one century. Of course, forecasting the future is a difficult task. You can invent many other things. But let's think about what we see around us today and how the today will affect tomorrow. And here on the panel, we have Michio Kako, the professor of physics, co-founder of strength field theory, Sadhguru, Yokai and Mystic, founder of Asia Foundation, Dmitry Metnikov, the deputy general director of the All Russia State Television and Radio Broadcasting Company, Dmitry Borodsov, uh, the general director of Bayeka. Good afternoon. I would like to start with you, Mr. Kako. We see many developments in science, uh, artificial intelligence, biotechnologies, robotics, media technologies, you name it. In your opinion, what will be the main driver by the year 2100? Previously, everybody thought that uh, the future would belong to cars, but uh, it turned out that Internet and IT drive for the uh, today. So what will shape the tomorrow? If our ancestors from 1900 could look at us today, what would our ancestors think of us? They would think of us as wizards, sorcerers, the ability to have magic mirrors called the internet, flying carpets called jet airplanes. So that's how our ancestors of 1900 would look at us today. Now, if we could see our descendants in the year 2100, what would we think of them living in 2100? I believe, as a physicist, and as someone who has interviewed over 300 of the world's top scientists for BBC television, the Discovery Channel, and the Science Channel. I believe that our descendants will resemble the gods of mythology, Greek gods. For example, Venus had a perfect body and was immortal. Already in medicine, we are not just tackling diseases, but we are enhancing and perfecting the human body and also isolating the genes which control the aging process. We have already isolated about 60 genes which control aging. We cannot reverse it yet, but I think that by 2100, we may have the ability to have not just biological immortality of some sort, but also digital immortality, which I'll talk about in a second. Then we have Apollo, the god of the sun. We will have solar power cheaper than fossil fuel technology of today because of revolutionary developments in batteries and storage. And we will also have fusion power. Already we believe that within 15, 20 years, we could have the first operating fusion reactor in southern France. And so we will have the power of the sun, Apollo, the god of the sun. And then Zeus was the father of the gods who could simply think, think and have things come true. That will be the future of brain-computer interface. For example, the internet. What will be the future of the internet? The internet of the future will be brain net. We will send memories, feelings, emotions, sentiments on the internet. Already in animals, we can now send the first memories in mice and now in monkeys on the internet. Very soon, we will be able to send memories to Alzheimer's patients to create a brain chip. You will push the button and memories come flooding into your hippocampus. And so that is the internet of the future. When we send emotions, feelings, thoughts on the internet, and this is gonna change everything. Entertainment, for example, will no longer be based on television or the movies. 
It'll be based on feelings that we can send on the internet. For example, when silent movies made the transition to talkies, that changed entertainment when we had movies that could talk. Now we will have movies that not only can talk, but can also feel and have sensations. And then we had Mercury, the god of speed. We will have supersonic transports, commercial supersonic transports, prototypes available in 2025. <laughs> NASA has already stated that they want blueprints from Lockheed Martin and other manufacturers to create a supersonic commercial jet that has no sonic boom. The sonic boom is the reason why the Concorde was a failure. Supersonic jets, a failure because of the sonic boom. We will use supercomputers to solve that problem. And then we will also go to Mars. Mars, perhaps by 2030, 2035, the first astronauts will go to Mars. And the price of space travel is dropping dramatically you realize that the movie The Martian, a hit movie, The Martian with Matt Damon, cost $100 million. But the Indians sent a probe to Mars for $70 million. So a Hollywood movie about going to Mars cost more than actually going to Mars. That has revolutionized space travel, and so transportation will be revolutionized. And then last, we had Pegasus, the flying horse. We will have zoos of extinct animals. We will be able to bring back animals that have perished tens of thousands of years ago. We now have the genome of the mammoth. We also have the genome of the Neanderthal. So in principle, we could bring back the mammoth and the Neanderthal. This is something that's being actively talked about in the scientific community today. And then lastly, what's wrong with this picture? We realize that the gods of mythology were also very foolish. They spent most of their time making tricks on each other and creating problems. What we need is wisdom, the wisdom of Solomon. And that is gonna be extremely rare in the future. But there is hope, and the hope is that the internet spreads democracy. The more people are educated, the more empowered they are. And that creates more democracy, and democracies rarely war with other democracies. Think of every war you had to memorize since you were a child. Every single war. They've always been between dictators, between kings, queens, emperors, but never between two major democracies. And so the hope is, as we spread democracy around the world, as we spread the internet around the world, then wars, we will still have them, but wars will be diminished in the future. And so the hope is that we will also have the wisdom of Solomon to go with the power of the gods of mythology. Mr. Kaku, I have also heard you say things about uh, challenges and threats of new technologies, the threats of drones or new technologies uh, or biotechnologies. Uh, this is an irreversible process. We already have battle robots. But uh, what do you think? The technologies of the future, will the humanity use them for bad, like uh, the nuclear bomb, or for good? Well, any technology is a double-edged sword. Any technology, one side of the sword, can cut against disease, ignorance, poverty, illness. The other side of the sword can cut against people as well. And so we have to make sure that we control this powerful technology. The three drivers of wealth generation in the near future will be one, artificial intelligence, two, biotechnology, and three, nanotechnology. 
A combination of these three technologies will generate enormous wealth and prosperity in the future. But let's not be naive. There's also the problem of nuclear proliferation, global warming, and the possibility of germ warfare. And so these are three technologies that could negatively impact on humanity. Not to mention that we have to worry about artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence, I think, will become an industry bigger than the automobile industry of today. I repeat, I think the robotics industry will eventually become bigger than the automobile industry of today because your automobile will become a robot. You will talk to your car. You will argue with your car. Your car will park itself and monitor itself. Your car will become a robot. But the danger is that robots at some point could become self-aware. That is the tipping point. Robots today do not know they are robots. Robots today have no idea that they are robots. They may have that awareness by the end of this century. At that point, they could become dangerous when machines become self-aware. But I think that's not going to happen till the end of this century. And meanwhile, the robotics industry will become bigger than the automobile in industry of today. Another interesting thing is that today we are working, uh, we are living in a hyper modern world by uh, but we use coal and fossil fuels for heating our homes and we don't have any microcomputers uh, at the tips of our fingers so I have to charge my iPhone every night uh, from uh, from which point there will be a qualitative change in energy production well a hundred years ago Thomas Edison and Henry Ford had a contest which technology would dominate the future Thomas Edison said it would be the battery. Henry Ford said it would be gasoline. Everybody laughed at Mr. Ford. They thought the answer is obvious. Edison will win. Because who wants to have a gas station on every block? Gas explodes. It creates fires. People will die every day if we have gas stations everywhere. Well, we all know who won the bet. Ford won the debate, which means that every day somebody dies in a car accident and is burned alive. Every day we tolerate gas stations on every block because Ford was right. But in the long term, Edison may also be right, but the problem is storage. The battery is the key problem facing solar and wind power. How do you have solar power when the sun doesn't shine and wind power when the winds don't blow? The bottleneck is storage, the battery. You see, there's no Moore's law for the battery. We assume that everything doubles every 18 months. We assume that. We assume that every Christmas, everything is twice as powerful as it was the previous Christmas. But that's not true. Moore's law only works for transistors. It does not work for the battery. But that's where new inventors are coming in today. Now, for the first time in 100 years, hundreds of inventors are pouring resources into the battery. That is the bottleneck that has prevented us from having a solar age and renewable technology in our backyard. So the price of solar of uh, batteries has gone down 7% per year that could eventually open up a new era of energy. Я еще хочу немножко поговорить о том, что будет с нашим обществом, на какие пласты она будет. I also would like to talk about uh, what can happen to our society. We have an entrepreneur in Russia who is uh, oh, like a Russian Elon Musk. He has a theory that uh, by uh, the year. Uh, 2100, the society will be divided into two groups. The, the people who are innovators, entrepreneurs, uh, scientists, they will govern all other people, these two groups. But what's your opinion, uh, what the society of the future would look like? Plato, 2000 years ago, 
believe that society would ultimately be controlled by philosophers. However, we know that philosophers are very bad at controlling power, resources, answering the needs of a growing population. And that's why I don't think that society will be divided along those lines. But the key to the future is education. We have to educate our people so that we don't split into smaller groups that will eventually war with each other. Because technology is not going to go backwards. Technology will only go forwards. Things will become more complicated in the future. And we have to educate our people, a primary emphasis on education, so that they can meet the challenges of the future. For example, artificial intelligence. The, the two groups that are the main losers in artificial intelligence are A, repetitive workers, B, middlemen, college-educated middlemen. For example, stockbrokers. People can buy stocks on their wristwatch today. You don't need a stockbroker. So why do you go to a stockbroker anyway if you can buy stocks on your wristwatch? The answer is you want intellectual capital, advice, knowledge, experience, innovation, talent, foresight. That's why you go to a stockbroker. You want something that robots cannot provide, and that is intellectual capital. Capital of the mind rather than capital of the hands. And that's why we have to educate our people so that we don't split apart into the categories that you mentioned. Спасибо большое, господин Каку. Thank you so much, Mr. Kaku. Thank you. Amazing. Question to Dmitry Morozov. Dmitry, you are the head of a company which treats diseases with biotechnologies. Will the diseases be still there by the year uh, 2100? People will always suffer from diseases. That's just the nature of their body, and that that is our burden. We have to pass through that. The nature tries to isolate the weakest people in the species. And uh, once uh, we And if people uh, cannot give birth to children, uh, the nature doesn't need them any longer. And we see that on the examples of uh, the people uh, we like, uh, the people uh, we love, uh, they are weeded out uh, by the nature. And uh, we seem to lose in this battle against diseases, and uh, the nature will still weed us out especially if we believe uh, in to Darwin says that uh, well the primates uh, have uh, a very short uh, lifespan and uh, we have already uh, depleted our lifespan and uh, we just leave there uh, with your permission I I'll have some uh, questions on this point uh, this never-ending uh, struggle with against death, this desire to live forever. Uh, recently, I spoke to uh, Mr. Churchill, a uh, biologist, uh, and we discussed the system that allows to change DNA, uh, that changes DNA on its own. So you think that people will be able to change the color of their eyes, uh, f shape of their head in the future? Uh, of course, plastic surgery originally uh, was aimed to correct some deformities. Will humans be able to uh, change their outward appearance on their own? A brief look backwards. Um, clearly, uh, we are a technology-driven civilization. Long time ago, we uh, <coughs> took a stick in our hands and uh, uh, through it uh, at an apple, got the apple. So our, our civilization was based on technologies, and one um, ancestor of ours taught another ancestor how to use a stick. Uh, 
what if an ancestor of ours had uh, telekinetic capacity, capabilities, and he could uh, remove the apple from a tree just by a force of thought? If, if, if that were the case, we would probably follow a completely different route of development, not a technology-driven civilization route. Um, so all these things which we're doing now is actually preconditioned by our uh, development route. Uh, and with the help of various technologies, we are studying nature. And we are uh, treating it uh, respectfully. Uh, we are trying to apply our technological knowledge, uh, our knowledge of the nature of things to, in order to understand, to grasp things which are ungraspable, incomprehensible. So we are always, we're not in alliance, not in alliance with nature, but we are a, a, an outside ob observer. Uh, we are observing the nature, and, and we try to uh, impact the nature. Do you, you ask the question about changing DNA? Yes, we'll be able to change DNA, but we are uh, um, fighting a losing battle. Of course, we can come up with all kinds of cartoons, scary cartoons for kids, um, uh, showing all kinds of transformations that a human body can undergo. Uh, I'm talking about the super superheroes, etc. But uh, we'll still be using a uh, scientific approach. We'll be a few steps behind uh, the nature. We should live in harmony with nature, and we should transform ourselves based on other needs. Uh, although plastic surgery, you, you got the point. Uh, young ladies transform their body to be more attractive to continue their lineage. Uh, and so there is a, a it's as part of their biological activity, biological agenda. Uh, we don't know. So we are already a technology-driven civilization. We don't know how we're going to interact with nature. We know we can affect the nature. We can impact the nature. But we're very limited in our, in our capabilities because of the uh, roots we chose uh, in the time immemorial when the first man threw a stick at the, an apple tree. So who should be responsible uh, for this engagement with nature to ensure that does not result in a catastrophe. We can, uh, you know, program kids in, 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 in mother's wombs. We can change our appearance. Probably we'll reach a point where people live six, for 600 years and that there will be old people will, will, will live for hundreds of years. Well, if you live for 600 years, you will not be uh, giving birth to people because you will lose interest in that. I'm talking about moral ethical capabilities. Uh, um, this is a uh, people will, will, will grow weary of life. If we become so technologically advanced, I think human will just become very weary and tired of life. And the new generation will come in our place. Uh, uh, but that, that would be a, a normal thing. Uh, death is a, a natural extension of life, so a death of one civilization will result in the creation of uh, another civilization on the planet Earth. I don't see anything dramatic about it. It's dramatic uh, from the standpoint of uh, one single human being, but in terms of the human species and the future life of human species as a biological species, I don't think it's dramatic. Uh, nobody told us that we should look the way we look now. I think we're going to change. Uh, if we travel in outer space, if we travel to other planets, we'll be adapting to other planets' environment. Uh, maybe we don't have to go to other planets. Maybe we just, uh, maybe we should uh, travel, make space travels in, in, in our astral bodies, not in physical form, but in the spiritual form. Okay, if we uh, throw a look at the medicine, because there are many, many people that, that need uh, medicine. They cannot, cannot afford those medicines because they don't have, we don't have uh, vaccines against cancer or AIDS. Uh, there are, um, uh, you know, medicine 
barons or magnates that, that jack up medicine prices? Do you think the development of technologies will overthrow this process? But you think that biotechnologies will still be the realm of the rich, the stomping ground of the rich? Well, I think the world is an unfair place. That, that, that's the way it was created from day one. I don't believe in this universal fairness. Uh, well, I still don't believe in that. Uh, so the world is an unfair place. It's part of the human nature. So the things you're saying, uh, that's the fact. And uh, they're, yes, they're medical barons, so to say, um, the, and uh, high-tech uh, treatments are, can, uh, uh, you know, are something the rich people can afford. But we can choose the vector of development. Uh, maybe we can focus on our consciousness. Uh, maybe uh, instruct our consciousness uh, not to fall sick that often uh, or give an order, give an instruction to yourself uh, to, uh, to, to grow another organ, for example. You know, I was once asked a question, why a lizard can grow a tail and a human cannot grow a tail? Uh, why, how come a lizard can instruct itself to grow a tail uh, and and we're not we cannot do that. Uh, so we I, I I guess we can do it, but not very fast. Um, the last question, a narrow, uh, more focused uh, question, similar to what I asked Mr. Kako. Do you think by 2100, what would be uh, the, the the most uh, uh, relevant things, the most relevant areas, DNA, DNA uh, stem cells? I think these. Things will develop in parallel. Uh, maybe uh, gene uh, tampering with genes will will come to the forefront. Maybe cell technologies. Uh, I, I'm certain that uh, we will. Uh, there will be a time when we have nanobots in our bodies taking care of our bodies. But the technological civilization and uh, our gaps in our understanding of nature will always be larger than our technological advancements. We are comprehending nature through technologies, and this actually defines the future course of our development. There's nothing else. Uh, naturally, we're going to improve techniques, methodologies. We'll be applying scientific approaches. That's the route we're going to move on. Uh, how are we going to treat cancer in 10 years' time? We know how, how we're going to do that because all modern uh, 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 med the, the, the drugs and medicines uh, that will be effective in 10 years, they're already de being developed now. So uh, maybe you know, what, is a, what is a cancer? I mean, maybe it's a natural natural uh, it's a natural way to part with life you know we can part with life in different ways we can you know f come down with cancer we can be run down by a car all of us will die so maybe it's just one of the ways to 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 leave this world to you know thank you dmitri uh, of course we're going to ask our uh, fellow panelists on this but i have a question to uh, dmitri Mel uh, Mel mednikov first uh, mid last century, what were we doing? We were sending people to outer space. What are we doing now? We are, are you know, designing thinner smartphones and tablets. You think that technologies in 70, 80 years' time will still be meeting the needs, the urgent needs of the people? Or do you think we'll be setting for ourselves some super, super objective, super goals like Gagarin's first trip to space? Well, thank you very much for the question. I would like to thank my colleague, fellow panelists to the left, who described the world of the future through antique, uh, through, through the metaphors of the ancient world, the perception of the world through the eyes of the Hellenistic theory, through the philosophical um, comprehension of this civilization. Uh, that is another example of the fact that the, the greatest minds uh, among our panelists, uh, if the greatest minds uh, resort to the uh, notions and concepts uh, which are two year, two hundred, two thousand years old. So this, the world we're living in now, actually was created two, three thousand years ago. And in our fantasies, we cannot step outside these boundaries. The investments to be made 
developments to be had uh, will first and foremost be, uh, will, will be based on fantasies so that the subjective world in which we're existing, uh, the world of physics, medicine, the world of space, and the world of uh, tablets uh, will become broader in order to uh, imagine a person, a human being, uh, living comfortably in this new world, to imagine a person uh, that is more interested in space exploration rather than a brand new tablet or a thinner tablet. Investments in human capital, uh, investments into new uh, ways of perception in the uh, transformation of consciousness. I think that would be the thrust of technological development in the future. For the time being, technologies, we need them to uh, reduce the amount of time a person spends on, on this or that uh, uh, physical labor, so labor automation, uh, the freeing up of human time. Um, I think it's 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 more simple than developing humans, uh, human beings, and uh, uh, my colleague colleagues can speak more about it. I think that any modern day computer is a lot more simpler than a human brain. A lot, uh, it's a lot easier to develop such technolo technologies rather than to uh, program and develop software for human brain. Uh, but I think that using the uh, capabilities of a human brain uh, as its computational computational capabilities and capabilities uh, for fantasy making will be used in the future. I agree with you, and uh, Misio is right, that whatever is happening to us, it was already made up a long time ago. Uh, so we uh, created robots. We, th we first thought about robots, uh, Android robots. They've become a reality. I know people who are uh, designing such robots, engineering such uh, robots, uh, and they told me that in 30, 50 years from now, they'll be performing all functions better than human beings, not only you know repetitive functions. They will be better at drawing up paintings, writing music. Uh, so the things which human beings believed were the the realm of human intelligence or human soul, uh, no, they're saying that robots will be better. All these occupations. What would happen to human beings in that case? What would be? Uh, well, the most important thing is that to prevent robots from uh, making uh, wilder fantasies than human beings. They will start making wilder fantasies. Well, in that case, they will become uh, people. In you know, in Japan, they have toys or puppets, they become human p partners. So, well, but the, the, those toys, they don't have imagination. Well, now they don't have imagination, but I think by 2100, they will have some imag imaginative powers. It, w it will be a completely different dialogue. I imagine two two toys, two puppets with imagination capabilities are meeting. Imagine their conversation. So. I think uh, those will win who can create something new, who can imagine something new. And to, uh, you know, in answer to my colleague uh, Plato, I would like to bring up Plato's ideas, his aidas, the uh, quantification of ideas. So those people who will be creating ideas, uh, those will be uh, creating robots, partners, so uh, no matter it's uh, whether it's bioengineering or some other uh, physics, uh, well, as creators of robots, we think that we will always be controlling, uh, will be in control. You know, because who knows that one day those robots will wake up, will wake up and say, "Why do we need you, people?" So I think the ones who make, who imagine, who make them, will control them. Uh, Dmitry, are you sure that we'll be able to imagine something? It's not a fact for me that we are uh, we're imagining something. I think everything has already been imagined before. We're just uh, relaying uh, whatever was imagined. Well, uh, let's again substitute the word uh, imagining with the word uh, studying others' imaginations or imaginary images. It, it would still require investments. I'm not talking about financial investments. I'm talking about total investments. So at some point in time, the humanity would reach the, the, uh, the, the uh, bifurcation point 
when it would have a chance to uh, come up with something of its own. Well, there is a concept, and I think our dear colleagues are aware of that. Uh, Akasha Chronicles, and uh, in those Akasha Chronicles, everything we think we came up with, it was already written, it was already created. So everything we can think of has already been created. And I think our uh, technological development paradigm uh, is uh, is akin to reading those imaginations and studying them. Well, if robots will, will replace humans, uh, some people say it will be paradise, we'll have tons of spare time, we'll be self-improving, robots will be doing everything for us. Well, the Americans believe that it would lead to degradation of humans because they would lose the site, they would lose the targets, the objectives for, for further improvement. Well, it's a question of whether humans would be able to imagine or create new space for itself. What my colleagues were talking about, basically the main idea is whether new ideas, they would create new ideas. Uh, Dmitry was talking about 600 years. And if somebody lives for 600 years, people would have to come up with something for 500 years because they'll become tired. Now would people live for 75 years? Imagine they would need to fill their, you know, 500 years more. So six times, uh, you know, six times more ideas, six times more content for life. The more time we have on our hands, a person who works at a plant 16 hours, you know, as was at the end of 19th century, 16 hours a day, uh, you know, had one hour uh, for the, of his personal time. The modern day man has, you know, works for eight hours, so he has more time, more personal time. Uh, so we're talking about life in perceptions, life uh, felt. So these abilities have increased twofold. Now we know people who uh, are having. Uh, you know, very varied life, and they're not engaged in mechanical labor. They're not degrading, and uh, it, that gives them twice as much time compared to those people who spend eight hours every day doing some mechanical things. So, and they're spending more time to make their lives more interesting and to lives to, to make lives of people around more interesting. I think that's the. Uh, for the first time, humanity uh, finds itself in a situation when it has uh, a lot of spare time, and we can uh, people can compete for their spare time, uh, and now people can come up with all different ideas on how to fill up that spare time. And those people ha who can succeed in doing that, they will 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 pass this route uh, physically, chemically. Um, and other people who are not in the position to do that, who fail to do that, they will end up selling flipping burgers for the rest of their lives. Uh, thank you, Dmitry. I'm going to ask uh, what's going to happen to TV, but Mr. Kako has uh, uh, has a statement. Or really quick, <coughs> really quick. I think that the tipping point as to when robots become dangerous is when they have self awareness. Perhaps by the end of the century. Right now, our most advanced robots have the intelligence of a cockroach, a retarded cockroach, a lobotomized retarded cockroach. But eventually, our robots will become as smart as a mouse, then as smart as a rat, then a rabbit, then a dog and a cat, and by the end of the century, perhaps as smart as a monkey. At that point, they are potentially dangerous. Monkeys know they are monkeys. Monkeys know they are not human. Now, dogs are confused. Dogs don't know that we are not a dog. Dogs think that we are a dog, and therefore they obey us. We're the top dog, they're the underdog. So I think at that point, 100 years from now, at the end of the century, we should put a chip in their brain to shut them off if they have murderous thoughts. That is a fail-safe mechanism. But that's only temporary. Because then what happens when robots become so smart, they remove the fail-safe system. <laughs> that is also possible in the next century, the 22nd century. At that point, I think we should merge with them. I don't think this will happen in this century, but I think in the next century, we should merge with our creation. 
why not become homo superior? Why not use exoskeletons, which are now being created, to become Hercules? That is the power of the gods. So in other words, one option, instead of fighting off the robots, in the next century is to merge with them, to become superhuman. Well, we have a choice whether to fight or to merge with them. I personally think we will have a choice because there's plenty of time. We realize that this is not going to happen anytime soon. Our robots are as smart as bugs right now, and we have many decades before we have to worry about this. If you put our most, if you put a bug in the forest, a bug immediately knows where to find food, how to hide, how to find mates, how to find shelter. A bug can do this. You put our most advanced robots in the forest, and what do they do? They get lost. They fall over. That's how primitive we are with robots. So we have many decades to plan for the time when robots become self-aware, and beyond that, whether or not we should merge with them. Now, some people think that the idea of merging with robots is repulsive, because it means that we're going to be a brain inside a vat of liquid. No, I don't think so. I think that we will want to preserve our basic shape. We'll want to preserve who we are. But we'll have, in addition to that, exoskeletons giving us super memory and superpowers when we feel like. But we will look pretty much the same as we do now. Correct me if I'm wrong. but uh, So if we decide not to merge with robots, I want to ask you the same question as uh, to Dmitry. Will robots develop themselves? And their intellect will develop, uh, and at one point they will sell, we no longer need you, human beings. Well, there is something called the singularity, the point at which robots can create robots of higher intelligence. We are far from the singularity today, but one day it could happen that robots will have babies. And these babies are smarter than the parents. And this process can rise exponentially fast. So rather than fight this, I think we should begin the process of perhaps merging with this technology and enhancing ourselves rather than fighting off what could be inevitable. Now, this is not going to happen, I don't think, in this century. But I think our descendants, our descendants will have the democratic debate as to how far to merge with our technologies or become extinct. Спасибо большое. Гуру. Thank you so much, Sakuro. All the hopes are with you. We are talking about technological breakthroughs, which at some point, maybe not today, not tomorrow, will happen. But we are already moving very fast. Previously, technology breakthroughs would happen every generation, but now they happen every day. First of all, can a human, a human brain cope with uh, such a speed of changes? Or people would just go crazy with that? Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> <coughs> there are two dimensions to this, which I think we are not differentiating here. One is uh, intellect, another is intelligence. Intellect can only function when there is an accumulated memory. Why a child in the village looks a little dumb compared to a city slick boy? is simply because he has more memory and information. <coughs> but if you leave them, in, leave them in real life situations, the rural boy may come out much smarter where a certain intelligence is needed, where information is not needed. So essentially, human intellect functions from memory and everything that we are considering or labeling as technology 
is essentially memory-based. Our imagination is memory-based. Memory means recorded past, something that we already know, how we can extrapolate into a, a different format. Essentially the same thing, finding expressions in permutations and combinations, but nothing new happening. Nothing new can happen from that. It looks new because it's a new presentation. It's a new format. Well, in terms of day-to-day -day life, it's absolutely new, of course. So technologically, whatever we do will lead us to a space where, where right now human societies have invested heavily. This I must uh, blame it on the European default because pre-Renaissance, when these societies were hugely restricted by dogmatic religious belief systems, when a few people broke through, that is, they decided to think for themselves, they refused to go by the book or the clergy and they wanted to think for themselves and when they thought for themselves, the amount of freedom that it gave them, they thought this is liberation. Because of this, from worshipping God to worshipping human thought became the mode since then. We call this scientific development. But essentially, human beings have started worshipping their own thought. What I think is more important than my very existence. Because of this, every capability that we get, we have been using it against ourselves and every other life simply because our thought is again a manifestation of the memory that we carry. If you allow me a few minutes, we in the Eastern cultures, in yogic culture, we look at human mind as sixteen parts. These sixteen parts can be categorized as four basic segments. It's called buddhi, I'm using the Indian terminology, I'll come to English. Buddhi, ahankara, manas and chitta. What this means is, buddhi means the intellect. Intellect, if we have to use an analogy, it is a knife. All of you, I'm sure, you would prefer to have a sharp intellect rather than a dull one. Yes? Hello? Uh, you must choose, I'm going to bless you. <laughs> sharp intellect or a d dull one? Sharp. So essentially, it is a cutting instrument. So we have a knife in our hand which gave us a certain access to knowledge because we could dissect whatever we want. This is the nature of human intellect. Whatever it is, is given to it, it will dissect and look at it. Everything is dissected, including human nature. But by dissection, you will know certain things. If I dissect you, I will know where your heart is located, where your liver, kidney and spleen is located and what's its condition. But I will not know you by any sense. When I say you, I am not talking about your thoughts, your emotions, your ideologies, that also can be known by dissection. We call this psychoanalysis, that's also dissection. But you will not know the nature of this life by dissection. There is no way to know that. So you're using a knife to stitch you will leave life in tatters. So knife is useful for cutting. So this knife of intellect is a powerful instrument of survival, not an instrument to know something be that is beyond your present level of perception. By dissection, you know certain things, but it is not beyond your present dimension of perception because this knife is useless without the bank of memory that you already have. 
what connects you to this bank of memory which we call as manas, which is a silo of memory, is a dimension called ahankara, which literally means identity. This is where misuse of technology is happening because of our identities. The moment you identify yourself with something, your intellect will ceaselessly work towards protecting that identity, either with our species or with our gender or with our nationality or race, religion, caste, creed, thousand other ways. Whatever is the nature of your identity, that is how your intellect will function. That is one care we have not taken in our education systems, in raising of our children. What is the identity? Because we need small identities to fight other people. We have been engaged with this forever. Anyway, leaving that aside, the manas is a silo of memory. This one thing I will subdivide for your understanding. We identify eight different types of memories in the manas. This is called elemental memory, atomic memory, evolutionary memory, karmic memory, articulate memory, inarticulate memory, and uh, conscious and unconscious levels of memory. When I say memory, we are not thinking about just what's in your head. Right now, there is more memory in every DNA that you carry or every cell in your body than your entire brain can carry. Because you may not remember how ten generations ago your great-great-great-grandfather looked like, but his nose is sitting on your face right now. Your body remembers. Your body remembers a million years ago how your forefathers looked, even the skin tone, it is not forgotten. So the amount of memory that the body carries is phenomenal. <coughs> memory is not just that dimension of memory that you can consciously access. There is memory. Memory is the thing which decides who you are right now. It is from this context you are talking about robots, becoming just like you because you understand, after all, if you build substantial memory, they'll just become like you and me. Those of you who are thinking of a robotic partner in your life, a robotic wife or husband, it's a good idea <laughs> because all the time the complaint in this relationship is your partner is not the way you want them to be. So you can manufacture them the way you want, you want them mild when you want them mild, you want them wild when you want them wild, you want them to be turned off and you want them to be turned off. This is a great idea. Yes. <laughs> and it may become a reality, if not very soon in some time, Mr. Kaku is more qualified to make the prediction as to when <laughs> So. Essentially, anything that you can build from memory can be built. Anything that can be built by storage of memory and access to memory and analysis of this memory and expression of this memory, everything that you are doing through your intellect and thinking that is you can be done by a machine at some point. I'm, I'm not the expert to predict when, but definitely it can be done, there's no question about that. But. There's another dimension of intelligence within the human being which we refer to as chitta. What chitta means is this is a dimension of intelligence where there is… where it, there is not an iota of memory, it is unsullied by memory. What this means is, see memory is what has made you everything that you are. You have a human form, this is evolutionary memory. You have variety of other memories, that's what makes you a certain kind of person and so many other things that you are. Your professions, your capabilities, your knowledge, everything is because of memory. But memory is also a defining boundary. The moment you identify with your memory, you say, oh, this is my friend, this one I do not know, this is a person I like, this is a person I don't like, this is all memory. 
memory fix, fixes a definition and a defined boundary to your life. What is me and what is you is just a question of memory, that I know this is me and this is you. But there is a dimension of intelligence which we call as chitta or in modern terminology loosely it can be called as consciousness. Not being conscious as you and me are, this is wakefulness, this is not consciousness. So, this dimension of intelligence has no memory in it. Where there is no memory, there are no boundaries to it. You will not do that with a robot, do what you want. Because everything that can be done by memory will be done. Right now, ninety percent or more of humanity lives by their intellect and their physi physiological and intellectual capabilities. These things can be built at some point and make them look very real. So once machines start doing this, it is inevitable, it is inevitable for you to explore the deeper dimensions of who you are. Right now this has happened in a significant way. In let's say a hundred years ago, if we want to be strong, if we want to be successful, we thought the best thing was to build maybe five hundred years ago, let us say. If you want to be a big man in the place, in your town, you had to have big muscles. Whoever had the big muscles was the big man, strong man there. But now if you have big muscles, we will give you a menial job. We don't recognize you. One reason <laughs> why women have a equal space or reasonably equal space on the planet today is because of technology, because the power of the muscle has been neutralized. How much brain power do you have, how much intellectual power you have is deciding things right now. But if intellectual power is again as muscle power was taken by the machines, if intellectual power is taken by the machines, naturally human beings will dig deeper into their consciousness. A machine cannot dig deeper, but everything that you can do, a machine can do in future and that will be a great day because that means we are on a holiday. We don't work for a living. Now we look at life in a completely different way which will be very, very significant. In fact, for the first time we will become human beings, we must understand why we are called human beings. That means we are the only creatures on the planet who know how to be. As you were saying, a bug knows how to survive better than you. Without a social atmosphere, many of you will not know how to survive. A bug knows how to survive far better than you, better equipped than you, because he's just focused on his survival. But a bug will not know how to be conscious. You can definitely build a bug. It's, a, it's very interesting that today in the computer technologies we are using these words, it, that's a bug, it's a virus, definitely. The dangers of this are also there, as the dangers of machines are there even today. For example, the automobiles are killing more people than wars every year, year after year they're killing. But we've accepted that as collateral damage, it's part of the thing. We're traveling faster, so some people will die. <laughs> we have come to terms with that. So similarly, maybe we'll have nano soldiers, soldiers won't be human beings going and fighting. We sit here and let loose on other people. At one phase it will happen. These things will be terrible, but even now it's terrible. You can just press a switch here and destroy a whole city somewhere else, it is quite terrible even now. So, before such capabilities come or as they are coming, there is no such thing as before and after, as these capabilities are coming, we must also strive to upgrade the human being to move beyond the limitations of their intellect, intellect and come to a deeper dimension of intelligence which is life itself. Как? The very source of life itself within us. Как, Гуру, как? Потому что 
рассказывают про... How, how can this be done? As practice shows, and we're talking about technologies of the future, no technology, no technological breakthroughs, no technological evolution uh, is changing uh, human nature, iPhone, latest iPhones uh, will never change the fact that people, you know, have been killing each other over a piece of land. They're still doing the same. They're killing each other over a piece of land. How can we ensure that, how can we resolve this issue? Because technological improvements are not improving human beings. Uh, maybe because the, the memory, ancestral memory uh, is so strong uh, in us that we still remember how our ancestors were fighting over a piece of bread. Maybe we'll continue doing the same because of the memory we have. See, uh, <laughs> the thing is, if anything needs to happen, a certain amount of human energy, time and resource has to be dedicated to it. For example, somebody was telling me, in 1860, when certain survey was done in United States, some kind of observation, probably studying dead bodies and stuff like that, the skeletal systems and things, they said in 1860, nearly 60 percent of the people would start losing their teeth at the age of 40. And in 1860, nearly 90, 97 percent of United States was illiterate. But today, people have their teeth intact even if they're ninety. And today, hundred percent is literate. How does this happen? Simply because we invested in what is called as schoolrooms and teachers and toothbrushes and mothers. We invested. If we did not invest, even today we would be losing our teeth, even today we would be illiterate. So, we have to invest in consciousness. Till now, we've been investing only in our survival, but once the technologies that they're talking about starts becoming a reality, which is already becoming, survival will not even be an issue. When survival is not an issue, we will definitely start investing, but the sooner we invest, with less aberration, we can move into these new possibilities. As Dr. Kaku said, it's always a double-edged sword. Which way are you going to use it depends on who you are, isn't it? So whether your identity and your experience is very exclusive or your identity and experience is very inclusive, this will determine which shape and in which way the sword will swing. Thank you so much. We still have some, some time left for the questions from the audience. Do you… does anybody have any questions? Members of the audience? No questions from the audience? No, there is one. Uh, for your really fruitful visions shared with us. Uh, my name is Konstantin Sonkin. I'm CEO of a uh, startup and a researcher in the field of neuroscience. And uh, my question is to Mitcho. Uh, Dr. Kaku, please, um, you shared with us your long-term vision about neurocommunication and brain-computer interfaces. But may I ask you about uh, like short-term goals for us, for developers, what to, what to develop, first of all, to contribute to daily life of a, a large population of consumers to increase the level of life of uh, humanity? Thank you. You ask a question, what are short-term goals in terms of brain-computer interface? Well, first of all, the, in the United States, the driving force behind this technology is the Pentagon. <clears throat> the Pentagon has given $150 million to create exoskeletons to bypass the injured spinal cord of soldiers wounded in Afghanistan and Iraq, so that the human brain directly communicates with an artificial hand, an artificial leg, and can walk. And if you saw the World Cup soccer games two years ago in Sao Paulo, Brazil, the man who kicked the football initiating the Sao Paulo games was totally paralyzed. He was a quadriplegic. He could not walk. But at Duke University in North Carolina, they put a chip in his brain to hook him up to an exoskeleton 
and he kicked the football. So the immediate gains is to, for people who are injured, injured in football accidents, car accidents, injuries of the spinal cord, injuries in warfare, to create an artificial body controlled directly by the human brain. Now, my colleague Stephen Hawking, the physicist who died recently, lost control of his fingers and vocal cords, but he could still communicate. And how? Because his brain communicated with a chip, a radio in his glasses. That chip picked up radio from his brain, converted it to electricity, to a laptop computer, and Stephen was able to think and write. So by thinking, he was able to write books and communicate with the outside world. So here's an immediate benefit for people who are paralyzed, their spinal cord is no longer functioning, they are disconnected from the world, and this will also make possible a brain chip for Alzheimer's patients, because we can now upload simple memories in mice and also in monkeys. Simple memories can now be put on the internet. This means that we want to create a brain pacemaker for Alzheimer's patients so that memories can come flooding into their brain and the Pentagon, again, recently gave $50 million to create a memory chip. A memory chip for soldiers, but also for Alzheimer's patients. And so here we have an immediate market for people who are afflicted with injuries, spinal cord injuries, as well as the aging process, to allow them to bypass the spinal cord, to access memories that they've lost, and here is a, a market, a market for companies that can utilize this to make money, to create products to alleviate human suffering. Пожалуйста. Thank you so much. I have a question uh, to Satoru. Um, very much interested in your point of view. Do you think a, a, a man can change his destiny in this life by uh, taking certain steps? Or do you think his all his steps, whatever he does in his life, uh, are related to other lives that would follow and his transformations? In other words, can a person or should a person try to change his destiny now or his destiny is preset? And uh, whatever he does in this life will only affect his future lives. What uh, generally people are calling as destiny is uh, what they largely create unconsciously. Whatever we do unconsciously, we can also do it consciously. If you can move your hand unconsciously, you can also move it consciously. So similarly, if you are creating your life unconsciously, you can also create it consciously. If you create something consciously, of course you would make it the way you want it. So destiny means a largely unconscious accumulations taking shape and taking their own tendencies and leading you on. You can make a conscious destiny. When you fail to make a conscious destiny, then generally it gets referred to as fate, fixed destiny. But is your destiny fixed? Definitely not. Otherwise, why all this effort? If everything is fixed, why you and me should live, we could die at our birth and just fine, isn't it? It's definitely in your hands. Whether you take it in your hands or not is always the question, it's an individual question. Abdul Entrepreneur, I have a question to… Uh, Distinguished Sadhguru, my question is as follows. Uh, when you said that uh, we need to invest in 
as much uh, into consciousness as much as in technology so that consciousness becomes uh, an island where humanity can uh, preserve itself uh, in the light of the development of robots. That's an island where we can still feel uh, like human beings. So my question is, uh, today there are lots of, lots of infrastructures uh, to invest into technologies. There are startups, there are investment funds. Uh, numerous scientists that are developing different solutions. How can we address the issue of investing into consciousness or self-consciousness? Uh, what needs to be done? What infrastructure is there in place? What solutions are there to, uh, to do that? Thank you. I would, uh, I would like to correct the question a little bit before I address the question. You use the analogy of uh, an island. <laughs> No, I want you to understand, human intellect is an island. All products of human intellect are small islands, including technology. Consciousness is the ocean in which we are existing. What consciousness means is an intelligence not identified with any memory, that means not identified with any boundary of you and me and this and that. See, you must understand this. On this planet, let's think of planet, but even the planet can be thought further. In this space, suddenly systems have happened, stars have happened, planets have happened. In that planet, life has happened. All of it fundamentally from an intelligence beyond this material that you're seeing as creation. All of it emerging from almost nothingness. It is in a way nothingness, but you must understand the word nothing by putting a hyphen between no and thing. It's not a thing because it is not a memory block. A memory block is a thing because it comes with a boundary. Once there is a defined boundary, it becomes physical existence. This is a dimension of intelligence which has no boundaries. So that is the ocean. You are mistaking the island for an ocean and an ocean for an island. So what do we have to do for it to manifest in human society is large scale. In every generation of people, there have been very conscious beings, but in some generations and in some societies, they have been heard. In other societies, they have been ignored. The other noise has been much bigger. So it is time we make that voice which refers to a dimensionless, a boundaryless consciousness heard. And methodologies as to how to become conscious, as there are technologies to create well-being in our surroundings, there is a science and technology to do the same within us. So this is not today's thing, this has always been there, it's as old as humanity, but in some generations it is heard loudly, in some generations it sinks and accordingly human well-being rises and sinks. Any amount of technology, if you don't know how to be, you still are not well. See, look at our own state right now. <laughs> As a generation of people, we know more comfort and convenience than any generation ever knew in the history of humanity. Our life is far more comfortable. No generation ever knew these kind of comforts and conveniences. But can you claim you are the most joyful and fantastic generation ever? No. People are becoming neurotic. I am not saying we are worse than other generations, but we are not significantly better for the amount of toll we have taken on every other life to have what we want to have. So, your technologies will bring comfort and convenience, will not bring well-being. It's time to focus on that because already we are at a place where technology is going through the ceiling, we are not matching up. It is like right now your well-being is still determined by what's around you, not what's within you. So this doesn't mean love thy neighbor, be like this, go be a good person, be a noble person, this is not about that. Your body and your brain should take instructions from you. If your body 
and your brain take instructions from you, would you keep yourself healthy and blissful every moment of your life? I'm asking you, if you had a choice, definitely you would. So obviously your body and your brain is not taking instructions from you. This means you're not conscious enough. So we have to invest in that direction. One thing is, if you walk through this city, I'm sure there are hospitals, there are schools, there are toilets and there is everything. But do you have a place where there is a place for people to meditate? There's no such thing. Eastern societies invested heavily in the past in that direction. But today, they are also emulating the West and trying to compete with them, losing out on this. But the need for inner well-being will become very strong in the next twenty, twenty-five years when technology starts doing most of the things that you're doing and you don't know why you exist. Then the need for well-being becomes super strong. So if we want to be ready for that day, it's very important that we invest both physical infrastructure and human infrastructure which focuses on the innermost core of who we are. Позвольте, я задам последний вопрос, адресован вам, господин Каку. Мистер Каку, let me ask you a question. For quite a while, I used to think that technological and communication progress leads to a total solitude of a human. Yes, people can connect via FaceTime, but uh, the become more and more isolated from each other and inward focused. Somebody has mentioned those dolls uh, but uh, and uh, fantasy about uh, what to do with those dolls, uh, but the problem is that people may no longer need each other when the, when the technology is developed. Will it happen? What do you think? A hundred years ago, when the telephone <coughs> was first coming in, there were many articles denouncing the telephone. The telephone, they said, was impersonal. We will spend too much time talking to this mechanical voice in the air rather than talking to our children and talking to our loved ones. And so they said the telephone is evil. Well, the critics were right. We spend too much time on the telephone. We don't talk to our children enough. But the telephone, we love it. We love the telephone because it expanded our horizon from 20 people to 2,000 people. And now mothers come up to me and say their children spend too much time on the internet. What should they do? Well, personally, I think that a new etiquette is being created for children. If you are a child and you're not on the internet, then you don't exist. A new social etiquette is being created. So I tell mothers that it's a good thing if their child is on the internet, otherwise they'll be an outcast, but they have to be socialized. And that's the key to the whole puzzle. We want to make sure that our people are socialized that they interact with real people in real time, make friends, make alliances, and engage in social discourse so that they can function on several levels. On one level, they can function in cyberspace because a new social etiquette is being created. And on the other hand, they can interact with people socially in, in terms of understanding pecking order, etiquette, politeness, deference to our elders, how to make friends, how to make coalitions. All these things are very complicated and we have to make sure that our children understand that as well. And so the internet does not have to be an isolated island divorced from the rest of society. If anything, it'll expand your horizon from 2,000 people to 2 billion people. And so I think that we have to make sure that our children are socialized and take advantage of the internet because the internet, as I mentioned before, promotes democracy. 
And as I concluded before, democracies rarely war against other democracies. So when your child plays video games with somebody from Norway, Mexico, or, or Afghanistan, that is a good thing. Because in the future, they may not want to war with people from these other countries because they are their best friends. So what I'm trying to say is a new social etiquette is being created. We have to make sure that we don't hide in it, but on the other hand, we have to use it because that's where jobs, opportunity, and new friends are going to be created. Can I, say something? Can I just say one thing? Of course. I think this fear about technology is just uh, fear about the unknown for most human beings. Everything that that is new, that comes in, of course, there will be a certain challenge of exerting ourselves to understand what it is. It will definitely not uh, create solitude. Uh, the problem should be more of there will be no room for solitude. <laughs> that will be the question <laughs> because we'll be too much connected. People wake up in the morning and the first thing they see is their cell phone, what are the messages they have. It's fine because the gadget is new. I think the next generation will learn how to handle the cell phone far better than the way we are handling it <laughs> because this is a new gadget, we are a little excited about it. I'm sure people will come to terms with this. <laughs> okay, last question from the floor. A very simple question. I want to ask uh, both uh, Kakosan and uh, Sadhguru. We are now in a situation of unprecedented uncertainty. Yeah, uncertainty. The God has rolled the dice. And we know that uh, the memories uh, which uh, we have discussed, that uh, electricity, electricity generates waves and uh, makes the heart beat. And when the heart no longer beats, a uh, person is dead. And uh, memory is also an archive uh, of memories, experiences. So what should we do? Forget everything, because the system is glitching. Yeah. So we have to reboot it. Can I ask you for a very short answer, please? that we have constant uncertainty, but I personally think that's a good thing. It's a good thing because new jobs, new exciting occupations, new challenges for humanity is being created. Now, I'm generally an optimist. Why? Because I think the smallest unit of history is the decade. Anything smaller than a decade, you get random noise. And therefore, when we look at the random noise, it looks frightening. Every day, a new emergency, a new crisis. But when you look at history decade by decade, then you begin to realize the enormous progress. And that came through to me every time I talked to my parents and my grandparents. Think of the world that our grandparents lived in, where high-speed travel was getting stuck in the mud when it rained, long-distance communication was yelling out the window, and a good long life meant that you lived to be 45 years of age. That's what the way it was for our grandparents. So I tend to be optimistic when you look at decade by decade, you realize that all the uncertainties you talk about are fluctuations within the decade. Dmitry, uh, Dmitry would you like to add anything? One, you you know, the, do the dice have been rolled, but whether to forget or to remember everything, well, it's difficult to say. Sagur, a very short answer, please. Your last comment. Uh, see, uh, <clears throat> we are complaining about too many possibilities. <laughs> You must understand in the past, uncertainty meant whether you live tomorrow or not. Today, your life is largely assured. Uncertainty is only in terms of possibilities and new happenings. You must celebrate this, not worry about it. 
because in the past it was always about war, it's about punishment, somebody is going to hang you, somebody is going to kill you. It's no more like that. There is a proper process for all those things. By accident, nobody can simply kill you or hang you or do things to you. Now it is only about possibilities. Uncertainty of possibilities is a fantastic situation. We shouldn't even ever complain about it. Спасибо, Дмитрий Медников. Хотите ли вы буквально два слова добавить? Дмитрий, just two words, and we'll be closing this session. Well, that's a very philosophic question, you know. Somebody asked me about uh, what the media would look like in 80 years from now. I thought about that. And uh, uh, I think that uh, it will be something like selecting your role, emotional behavior model at any point in time, the one that you like best. Okay, thank you so much. I want to thank.